With how technology is developing today, finding time to maintain and develop meaningful connections seems to be growing increasingly challenging. Some of us get so comfortable with solitude and having our needs met with technology that the idea of building a tribe causes fight or flight. In today's episode, Jason Skisik will share with us the importance of building your tribe. Jason Skisik is a U.S. Army veteran, coach, and entrepreneur. He is a father, husband, fighter, and carrier of heavy things. His company, Spear and Clover, helps businesses with passionate leaders, talented teams, and strong playbooks to go from contenders to championship dynasty organizations. Jason is hosting the weekly Spear and Clover podcast on YouTube and across all audio platforms. Follow our show and bookmark our podcast so you don't miss out on our fantastic Matrix mentors. Good evening, Jason. Can you tell us about your mission and your passion? Samantha, it's so nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Uh, and thank you for sharing your audience with me. Um, absolutely. So uh, you talk a lot when you were introducing me, and I appreciate you doing that, uh, about tribe. And this is something that's so important, not just to me, Samantha, but to human beings in general. Um, and I really, uh, I grew up playing sports. Uh, I went into the military, which is a very tribal organization. Uh, and then I, I started a CrossFit gym after that. Uh, along my journey. And in every step of the way, the people that I connected with the most were those people who I had been through really hard, difficult challenges with, whether it was in the military, you know, accomplishing missions, or whether it was working at the bank with a group of other analysts, or whether it was going through a hard workout. Um, and so for me, you know, you talk about technology, I would also say, you know, in the past, humans were gathered around religious organizations in a way that was much more than we are now. And so I think people naturally, culturally and evolution wise are drawn to sort of these centers of ethics, whether that's, um, you know, a painting club or a running club or a CrossFit gym or a yoga studio uh, or podcasting. Right. Um, and so for me, I think it's just it's nice to be as an entrepreneur to try and tune in to what my type of people gather around and really just to try and lean into that if I can. That's so true. I agree. Uh, tribalism is a big part of our evolution, why we succeed so much as a species. How did your life path teach you the importance of building a tribe? Yeah, kind of like I just mentioned, um, you know, we, I've been in a lot of different environments to varying success with varying difficulty. And the worst times were when I felt alone. And I think a lot of people can probably identify with that. And so what I do have done in my entrepreneurial journey, as well as what I try to help other visionary entrepreneurs to do, is to build tribe where the people that they want to serve feel like they can see their reflection in their community and build community around these ideas. So again, kind of like I mentioned before, I don't care if you're really into comics or you love movies or you like building birdhouses. It doesn't really matter. Technology has actually given us the keys to finding other weirdos like us all over the world, right? And so there's this great opportunity to build cathedrals to those tribal kind of things that we're interested in. Can you tell me how some of the skills from that you acquired maybe in the military translated to another area of life that most people wouldn't expect? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think everybody knows that the military is difficult. What they don't maybe think about is it prepares you perfectly to be an entrepreneur. And I'll tell you why. Um, well, one, you can't quit. And number two, they have to train you to do a perfect job, basically an excellent job every single time you do it. And they don't get to pick who their employees are. And so you get this really broad range of people who are, some of them are super talented and some of them, honestly, Samantha, not so much, right? And so what the military has to do is they have to train you how to do a really important job in such a way that nobody could mess it up. And so as an entrepreneur, I took that with me. And so instead of just saying, hey, Samantha, go write this email and send this thing and build a website. Now it's very much driven by repetition and practice and getting people to find ways to work together. Uh, because in the military, you don't get to choose who your boss is. You don't get to choose what your job is in most regards. You don't get to choose who you work with. And when you get there, you can't quit. And so it's, it's one of these things where you learn if we can do the training and the team better, we can push down the requirement for how talented our employees are. And that's a really powerful thing uh, when you want to have high level results for an entrepreneur, you know? 
Absolutely. Uh, that the method also brings so much security for anybody who, who's in training and I could see the how sufficient that could be. How has CrossFit opened up your life to the beauties of tribalism? Yeah, so uh, it's interesting. I've owned a CrossFit gym for 12 years. I sold most of it a couple of years ago when I moved away from the area. But, you know, obviously always have a huge place in my heart for that community and that tribe. Um, you know what? I, I always thought that I, I thought I was a fitness guy. I owned a CrossFit gym. I started it with two friends who were also veterans. And then I ended up uh, kind of being the sole proprietor of that business for a while. Um, and for a number of years. And during that time, I would have told you, Jason Skisik is a CrossFit guy. He's a fitness guy. And, and I love those method methodologies. But what I found is, you know, I moved to a new place and I do jujitsu and kickboxing now. And I love building tribe around entrepreneurship. And so what it really what turns out is it's this, Samantha, that I love. It's, it's, it's meeting with other like-minded people. It's, it's, it's having these relationships. It's creating an opportunity for others to have these relationships. And so whether it's, you know, CrossFit, which I do love and certainly uh, enjoy the methodology and it's helped me a ton, or whether it's kickboxing or podcasting, you know, I'm much more um, have learned as I've matured and really thought about the way I feel about the world. I'm much more drawn to the collection of, of people in communities and tribes than any one particular activity or even any ethic, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Um, in the past, I interviewed a man named Dr. Vic, and he his in his theory, he saw that the matrix was the collective unconsciousness or collective consciousness. And um, I never thought of it like that. And when I did, it real it made me realize why we love storytelling so much. Like we're all built very similar with like our DNA, having two arms, having two legs. But our lives could look completely different just based off of the environment we were raised in, what neighborhood we were raised in. And we all have unique sub matrixes. How can we take our differences to build deeper connections when we're building our own tribes? Man, that is such a great question. And so where I would start is saying, the only the path I, I'm assuming you're sort of building off of this idea of the matrix right like the movie almost and so like the path to seeing that is is really to get past your ego and there's a number of ways you can do that whether it's through meditation or yoga or psychedelic drugs or you know float tanks or whatever it is I'm a float tank guy um and what I will tell you oh yeah once a month uh with maybe a little additional help as well um but what I would say is uh any way that you can put down your ego or your identity and see the world through fresh eyes is Im it's immediately when, whenever you hear from somebody whether it's a, an indian yoga guru or a psychedelic enthusiast or somebody else that's into meditation or whatever it may be they immediately will tell you it's not that they think we're all connected in this common shared experience it's a knowledge that you know in your bones and so the only thing that stands in our way from seeing that very clearly is that ego that puts our identity in front of the view of that. And so the way to get beyond that is to regularly, introspectively peer in and then draw understanding to the outside, which I think of as like fractal and infinite, right? Like the outside, like our, our experiences are so common and I think the reason why we pick out those things that we disagree on is because how common and archetypal our world actually is. I think of everybody in the world, I don't care if you're a web developer or a podcaster, you represent sort of a part of like this archetypal village, if that makes sense. And so there are people that are the builders and there are people that are the teachers and there are the storytellers and there's the shepherds, right? And the fishermen or the hunters. Um, and so regardless of how you choose to express that, if you can just take one slight step to the side of your normal view of the world, you'll see very quickly that it doesn't actually matter um, the sort of the extremities of what we think. It's much more the core beliefs that are gonna impact us and that we share in common with, I think, everybody across the world. And I've seen that in my travel. Absolutely agree. Can you give us an example from when you were traveling? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I lived in Germany when I was in the army for two years. And I, I'll never forget the first day I got there because Germany is a European country. It's a modern country. Uh, you know, people there look 
vaguely like me and, and uh, you know, they drive cars that I've seen before. But I just noticed how they, they solved all the same problems, but they were just a little bit different. Uh, this was years before the smart car, the little two plus two or whatever. And th that Those little things were driving around and the way that they did trucks, semi trucks, they just looked differently. Uh, the way that the buildings were looked differently. If it, it, it would be easy that first day for me to have been like, oh, this is like a third world country. But anybody who's listening to this knows that Germany is in fact at least as technologically advanced as America and they just have solved their problems differently. Um, or another example would be if you go from Illinois to Arizona or Southern California, you'll see different roofs on the houses and you'll see some houses like here, all houses have basements. In California, almost no houses have basements. And you're, so there's, there's just these differences in the way that humans have had to solve problems and go about doing things. Um, and then of course you can, you can start to look at how religions all have flood stories and they all have origin stories and they all have, there, there's, there's these common ethics that I think are threaded throughout just like our awareness of existence, right? Um, and I think it's in our nature to seek answers, and we find answers that solve similar problems that are just slightly different. Yes, I I've, I agree, and I see with I see that a lot. And um, I love that you brought up the religious text because you know we know that Babylon was one of the first major cities during the time period, and to me it was just common sense for me to believe like see the unity before the differences because the differences could just be semantics because if we think about Babylon you had people that were speaking all kinds of different languages telling the same story and I think that's a big thing when it comes to building a tribe too where we should put more effort into seeing how we're we have more in common with each other instead of letting the differences stand out I realize that a lot of the like terrible things that happened in our history was when one party was dehumanizing another by trying to deny how human the enemy was by highlighting differences. What do you think about that habit humans have, that false sense of security that like alienating a group of people may have? And how can we take steps to correct that? It's a really, really good question. If I had a good enough answer, we could change the world today, but I don't know if I will. Uh, and so I'll give you the best I can. Uh, and that would start with, you know, it took however many hundreds of thousands or millions of years to us for us to evolve to be these sort of advanced higher primates that have these groups and tribes of relationships. Uh, you know, Dunbar did a, a lot of really interesting research into that as far as how our communities work and primates coexist. Um, and so I think it would be... Uh, irrational for us to believe that somehow we'd be able to evolve our culture quickly enough to not put up those walls. We evolved to think that person looks like me and talks like me, that's a friend. That person doesn't look like me and talk like me, that's a foe, right? And so I think what we're going through is sort of the growing pains of trying to force a increasing or like a, 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 um, a quickened evolution of our culture. Um, but I do think we're making good strides towards it. Um, there was another point that you hit that I wanted to address. Um, I think I think I'm, I'm going to have to let it go. I don't know if I remember it, but uh, but yeah, I think uh, I think it's so um, it's so difficult, right? I mean, even even this thing, right? Like like how could we possibly be expected to to take in all of the amount of news and likes and dislikes and comments and phone calls and all of those things when we were evolved as organisms to not have to deal with that level of information or you know existential threat or you know if you knew one person who got murdered in your whole life in a village that was a big deal unless you went to war and it's like i read about murders every single day and i see them reenacted on tv and all of those other things i'm certainly not saying we should stop those things but i think we should appreciate oh i remember those i think we should appreciate that those things are are difficult for us to to maintain uh, one way, and I've learned the way, Samantha, to never lose an argument again. Do you want to hear it? Yes. Okay. The way to never lose an argument again is to go into it not needing to be right, is to go into it looking for what the true answer to this debate is, and once you find it, to align with that side. And so what th this has been a huge shift for me. I stopped trying to win arguments, and I started trying to find the truth, and sometimes I would start on the right side, 
but every time I would finish on the right side. And so super quickly, I, I found myself like shoulder to shoulder with so many more people. And so uh, what I'll find is I go into these arguments thinking, okay, so here's Samantha, who's clearly an intelligent human being who's like deep thinking, and we disagree on this thing. Well, she's not a fool who just pulled that out of a hat. So she must have done, I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt here, have done some similar amount of mental effort to come to her conclusions. So now I almost try to prove your point. I steel man is the word for that. I almost am like, okay, so how could she be right? Or how could she have ended up here? Because I've just met too many just brilliant and wonderful people who disagree with me on important things. Um, and so um, that has allowed me to almost never, I, I keep my wife out of that. We argue all the time. But you know, when it, the closer it is, the harder it is, but I'm working on it. Uh, but yeah, I, I've really tried to to learn how to enter into a con an, an argument or a debate or a conversation seeking truth, not being right. I'm definitely going to try that personally. And it's funny you mentioned your wife because I was just thinking about my current relationship. Well, that's the so like the closer it is to you, the harder it is to be like like I was just uh, we have a running joke. My wife and I right now we have a daughter who's 18 months out. Shout out to Lucy. Um, and um, thank you. And uh, you know, it's stressful when you take her to a restaurant or we go to Thanksgiving or we're in the car for too long or whatever. And I'm like, babe, you just got to do breath work and you're going to be, you can lower your fight or flight response. You can give your endocrine system or your, uh, I'm sorry, your, your autonomic uh, nervous system and da, 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 da. I'm giving her the Wim Hof. And then like the next day, I'm like, this is driving me crazy. And my wife's like, just do breath work. <laughs> like, <laughs> and so that's kind of the running joke in my house right now. And I think that's real. I think I think being um, a mature, thoughtful human being is not a skill, it's a practice. Meaning I don't just acquire the skill and now I'll never get mad in traffic again. It's a practice that I have to endeavor in every single day. And so it's all about building habits that kind of lead you towards that. I totally agree. Like on my personal journey, something that really changed the game for me was when I realized that my emotions don't excuse my behaviors. So it just made me like, okay, I feel this way. I'm not going to react like that because it's irresponsible. And I, I need to articulate what I'm going through right now and see if there's something to solve, but then not outsourcing the solution, actually working on it so that I feel satisfied. Because it's ironic. Somebody can give us an answer to our problem, but if we don't put enough effort into thinking of it on our own, it's going to go. Whoosh. Yeah, Socrates figured that out. and We keep forgetting it. Uh, <laughs> uh, one thing I would add to your point is you could invert that too. And you were saying your, your emotions can't dictate your actions. But I would also say that the best of us are able to take other people's actions or the world's actions or whatever happens outside of us and not allow that to impact the way that our emotions flow. And I'm not sure if one's harder than the other, but though that is a two-way street where when something happens, it's my choice ultimately to be angry or to be upset or to, um, you know, lash out or whatever it may be. And so, uh, again, breath work, psychedelics tanks hard exercise by the way hard exercise every single week i call it collective elective suffering shout out to robin Lalonde who gave me that uh and when you do that you're the the scale of what easy and hard is it gets so much further this way that like it's it's like the things that used to be hard kind of make they're not really that impactful anymore absolutely and that, i like that you brought that up because i thought about um how we're seeing murder and things like that more often and things that we wouldn't experience in a tribal setting if we didn't have technology. And it's interesting how we're being prompted to be desensitizing a lot of the big moments in life. And when I was putting together the questions that I wanted to ask you, I realized that it could be very perplexing on how we can approach building relationships again after the pandemic, after depending on technology, because it's some it's a place that we go to to get emotional arousal. Like just watching something, we can experience something, experience empathy, get a whole visceral experience. How can we shift and use, like instead of just always getting gratification from the technology, how can we use technology to build relationships with those around us? I was standing in the airport uh, coming home from Arizona three weeks ago, and I saw a guy standing on an elevator, and he was just standing there and riding up this very, like a long elevator in an airport. You know, it's like two floors worth of an elevator. 
And I thought to myself, I don't know why I thought of this, but I thought to myself, the guy who created the elevator did it so that we could get where we were going faster and be more productive. We could walk up this elevator and we'd get up there three times as fast and we choose to stand on it and be lazy. And then it occurred to me that that's how most of us engage with most technology. So this phone is the key to my, this conversation is the key to mine and your ability to impact an immense scaled audience that can change the world for the better. And often people use technology like this, platforms like this and, and other, other things like that to be lazy or spit vitriol or violence or anger or divide us. The problem that came in 2020 was this perfect storm of what it was. A lot of times people compare it to like 9-11, how everybody came together after 9-11, but the, the actual ingredients of this perfect storm in 2020 were that it was a virus that by definition separated us physically. You had the, the people that were your enemies weren't in some other country. The people that were your enemies were the people that might have a bug that you've never met before or that you're friends with or families with. And so you were physically separated. And I think, again, we're just not evolved to function well in that environment. Um, and I think that that is what we've seen. And so the, the, the other things that have come about tangentially to that, the political divide, the cultural divide, um, just any number of topics that we could go down that probably feel radioact radioactive to both of us, they were all multiplied by the fact that our neighbors were now the silent enemy. Um, and I think that's going to take time to heal, but I think conversations like this one can be a good start and can maybe accelerate that process. Yeah. How can one find, like, how can one take steps to start building the tribe that they desire? I think it starts by going on a long walk. I think you go and you figure out what it is that you enjoy and love and where do you get the feelings that you do. I mean, like I said earlier in this conversation, I mistook that for me being a fitness tribal leader. Um, and by the way, love fitness. You don't, you want to be in a gym with me. I'm, I'm a lot of fun. Uh, I have high energy. I'm clapping you on the back. Shirts are coming off sometimes. We're having a great time. We're going we're gonna to get some PRs today, like when we're in the gym. But ultimately, it's the feeling I get when I help somebody to see themselves in a mirror in a new way. It's the feeling that I get when I have my arm around somebody's shoulder and we're standing at the top of a, of a sand hill that I just climbed with a pack on. It's the feeling that I get you know, when we go for a long run and I didn't stop because I could see you in the distance and I didn't stop. So we did it together. And so those are the things that move me and I can apply that to anything. And so what I would say is like level one is like figure out the things you like to do, but level two, take meta analysis and start to think about like, what is it about that? Like, why do you, Samantha, like having a podcast? Is it just that you have a message that the world needs to get? But like, what is the feeling you're pursuing? And is there a tribe available to you that maybe you don't really understand the components of yet? Well, go on a fucking walk and let's figure it out. I love that. I love that accountability. And it sounds like a fun adventure. It's just, I feel like this, this, that's the true walk of life, like finding the journey instead of, you know, living in the matrix and just doing what you think you're supposed to do, stepping out there and thinking about what you want to create and pursuing what you would like to experience. Do you like Hunter S. Thompson? Do you know who that is? I, I think I've heard of them. Uh, have you ever seen Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas? No. Oh, okay. I just, before this call, hung up a poster, and it says, freedom is something that dies unless it's used. And I think that's appropriate to what we're talking about. So that's my constant reminder. A very colorful. It's the opposite of, of my big map over here. Uh, it's like super colorful and weird looking. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, I think in the beginning, one thing I would say is, uh, not everybody wants to stand up and take responsibility for building a tribe. And if that's the case, that's fine. Um, I learned in the military, when there's an opportunity for responsibility, I step forward. Other people stay where they're at, and even other people step backward. Okay? Not a big fan of that third group, but that second group is totally fine. Somebody has to be the tribe members, right? Um, and so what I would say is, it's a lot of responsibility, and if you don't want to carry that water, I understand that. And so that's a part of that walk, too, is, is identifying, like, where do I want to be um, with regards to this thing, whether it's a tribe that I lead or a tribe that I'm a part of um, or a, a group that I follow and lurk from, from maybe even outside. That's totally fine, too. But if you can, if you, we all want to seek togetherness. We all want to seek family. We all want to seek that feeling. 
And I just happen to believe that it's it's much more readily available now than it has been for about a hundred years. I think we all had it back in the day when banishment was like the worst thing you could do to somebody. Um, but I think for like the last hundred years, ever since like the industrial revolution, it's been very easy for people to become a faceless name or number in a crowd. And by the way, this starts to solve a lot of problems. Like who's doing school shooting? It's people that are like isolated and alone. Who's doing, um, you know, who are the politicians that, that are leading our country maybe in the wrong directions? Well, they're people who are disconnected from the community from like a physical skin to skin, like literal way. Um, and who are the best of us? They're the nurses and the doctors and the soldiers and the people that are, that are actually in the trenches engaging with other people and trying to help people's lives. And I just think that, you know, there's like a very fundamental, you talk about looking away from the matrix, like forget about all the pomp and circumstance of your title. I don't give a shit if you're like an executive vice president of blah, blah, blah. If I talk to you, I can tell you within three minutes if this is going to be, you know, an authentic conversation or if you're just going to be speaking LinkedIn to me. And if you just want to speak LinkedIn, you can do it to somebody else because I don't have time for that. Yeah. Because freedom isn't free, baby. We got to get out there and use it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I find this so inspiring. If one of our listeners were to seek your guidance, where they can, where can they find you and what would their experience be like? Yeah, that's a great question. So first of all, if you've made it this far in the conversation, there's a good reason for it. And so I want you first to go and look up the organic matrix online, like it, follow it and share it with somebody else. Samantha is pouring her heart out and, and really has done a lot of hard work to, to get to this point uh, with her podcast. So support her first. If you still have energy left over and you're a entrepreneur or an entrepreneur, um, hit me up. Uh, I'm available. Uh, you can find me on Instagram as my platform of choice. I'm Jason Stesick on Instagram or Spear and Clover on Instagram. You can find my website at spearandclover.com. Um, and what I will tell you is I help entrepreneurs that have made it to where they're at by knocking down walls and doing all the hard work and wearing all the hats. That's not the thing that's going to get them to the next level though. So for those folks, I help them to take the magic between their ears and scale it out to a team so that they can build a real uh, mission that can impact the world. And I do that not with answers. I don't have answers for you. I think anybody who sells you answers is probably a liar. I sell questions. And so I'm going to ask you, and the cohort would ask you, questions that are designed to reveal exactly the organization that you should be running. Thank you so much, Jason. I'm really excited to explore your website some more because I think questions are the most healing way to build neural pathways. Totally. I agree. I mean, you're, you're, I think we have a lot of alignment here, Samantha. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you too. Would you like to share some words of advice with our Matrix members before we start our rapid round fire? Uh, sure. Um, you really can have the life that you dream of. I think that a lot of times we skate over that. I think if you really understand the mountain that you want to climb and you're willing to behave like a person who could climb it, over the course of time, if you only take steps towards that mountain, you will one day find yourself on top of it. I don't know what that mountain is for you, but I'm sitting pretty high on top of mine right now, um, and I can see the, the peak. So um, so really, I, I can't tell you enough. Like I, I have been blessed to be inspired by people and have become one of those people that lives the way that I would design my life to be. And that was deliberate, and you can do it too. I love the way you put that. Behave the way you want to be. Like the model of who you want to be i think that's the biggest thing like when we use um the law of attraction and we create uh, our future selves where we want to be in the future one of the crucial things i learned to how to actually reach our goals is we have to embody the principles around the person we want to be yeah so uh there's a, a former mentor of mine uh trevor cashy he's a nutrition guy but brilliant guy uh, and he said, there's an ethic. That's the ethic you want to uphold, the person you want to be. I want to be an Olympian. And then here's your behavior. And if you want to be an Olympian, Olympian and you sit on the couch all day playing video games and eating Cheetos, you're not going to have a happy life because there's this dissonance, which is the gap between these two meters. So there's only two things that you can rationally do. You can either reduce your ethic and have that of one who sits on the couch and eats Cheetos all day, or you can change your behavior and behave like someone who goes to the Olympics, right? And if you can do that, it really is that simple. I think a lot of times people think it's hard, but our motto at my company is winning is simple. And I think that's true. I love this. So our rapid fire, our first question for our rapid fire round is what is your favorite age growing up? 
Man, I feel like now's pretty good. Um, favorite age growing up? You know, I had a really good 26. Uh, I was living in Germany, traveling all over Europe. I had some great friends, and I was in pretty good shape. So I think that was probably probably my favorite age growing up. That sounds awesome. What activity instantly calms you down? Jiu-jitsu. I love jiu-jitsu. I was just going to say that there's nothing to calm you down like, you know, somebody choking the life out of you for an hour and a half. I totally understand that. I was a collegiate wrestler. Oh, get out of here. Yeah. I did not lead with that. Come on. You, you're kind of like a chameleon, Samantha. I don't understand you yet. And we're pretty far into this conversation. You're an interesting person. Thank you. What's funny is my boyfriend raises chameleons. Oh, even even with this. <laughs> a collegiate wrestler. You got to be my daughter. She's already, she's 18 months. She's at the gym three times a week. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, that would be amazing. I would love yeah. to yeah. maybe go to your gym and tra- do uh, some jujitsu yeah. with you. Hell yeah. I trained with Miguel Torres. He was a champion in my WC and Strike Oh, Strike Force. That's yeah. sick. And he was in the UFC too. Yeah, Miguel Torres. Look him up. He's a he's a pioneer. Yeah, I mean, he's real real. Yeah, I got to yeah. check him out. I have yeah. to stay in contact. Yeah. What is the phone app you use the most? Instagram for my news app, which I'd like to delete. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Jason. I really appreciate you sharing with us today, and I look forward to staying in contact. Of course. Samantha, thank you so much. This is an awesome show. You, you, this is a deeper show than I expected. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> I, I, I love that. I am honored. Jason's program, Dynasty Define, helps businesses with passionate leaders, talented teams, and strong playbooks to go from you know, go from contenders to championship dynasty organizations. Join him on his website in the description below, www.spearandclover.com. All feedback is welcomed and helps us serve our fellow Matrix members. To stay up to date with our Matrix mentors and what we have in store for you, bookmark our website and subscribe to our podcast and YouTube channel. It was great to have you with us on the Organic Matrix show, and we'll be seeing you on the following download.